had a fascination for cats from a very young age. This is me at about three years old, chasing a poor tabby cat near the time of my birth in Attica, Athens. I liked them so much that after school I pursued a high degree in nature conservation at the School of Natural Resource Management in George, South Africa. It's probably one of the most beautiful university campuses on earth, not only because of these stunning upper temperate forests, but also because these guys live there. They're called Cape leopards and they're one of the world's smallest leopards. They only weigh about 20 to 45 kilograms in size. And for about three years I got to chase them through these mountains, radio track them, camera track them, and even look at the interactions with local cattle farmers in the region. Now, they ignited in me a passion to pursue a master's degree in zoology at the University of Oxford, where I not only learned how to do really cool science with big cats, but work that would serve their conservation management. Here I am with my two mentors from the Panthera Foundation, Guy Baum and Tristan Dickerson. And we got to work on a big project looking at the sustainable trophy hunting of African methods. But why big cats? Why do we hear so much about them and so little about the poison dart arrow frog in the Amazon jungle? or even the birds of paradise in Papua New Guinea? Well, I think a lot of it's got to do with human culture, religion, and even evolution, and how that's changed over millennia. This is a photograph that was taken by Tyrone Bradley in 2014 in a place called Nklagagazi Mountain, in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. And what it shows is Zulu men that belong to the Shembe Church. And every year they climb this mountain, and they celebrate their faith through traditional dance, and by wearing leopard furs. In fact, leopards have been central to their culture for over a hundred years. When it comes to religion, you only have to look at two men like this, praying to a tiger and leopard deity known as Wagorba. And you can find temples like this strewn across the Indian landscape, where people pray for protection before entering the forest. Hell, even this guy, Conor McGregor, a man with the 13-3 MMA record and the current featherweight UFC champion. If you only saw the way that he delivers those spinning back kicks and hooking left jabs, you know exactly why he's got that Bengal tiger tattooed to his belly. But there are also ecological and economic reasons as to why these cats are so important to us. If we just take these guys, for example, they're called mountain lions, and they're distributed across more lines of longitude than any other big cat. When you pull them out of a system like this, this is a Zion National Park in the United States, you'll find that your prey populations will explode. Things like mule deer and small antelope. And in the process, they'll eat up your vegetation. So in this photograph, you can see these beautiful, mature Fernmont cottonwood trees. There's almost no young ones. In the process, that affects a whole bunch of other biodiversity that relies on the vegetation. So in places where you actually found mountain lions, you'll find more astral flowers, more hydrophytic plants, even more butterflies. You transplant this idea to tigers and leopards, it'll work the same. In places like the Malaysian Paso Forest, you'll find pig densities that are 40 times higher when you don't have the cats. That's the true price of predation. But what if I, thought, if I told you that big cats can potentially save people and help manage pest populations in our city? This is a photograph that was taken by Steve Winter from National Geographic magazine in 2014 on the outskirts of the 13th largest city in the world, Mumbai. This is us there last year, trying to get some pretty cool video footage with Bertie Gregory as part of the biggest story ever covered by Nat Geo magazine and television on Netflix. Now, if you've ever been to the city, you'll probably remember three key things. The incredible hospitality, food and warmth of the Indian people, the gateway of India, and also dogs. A lot of dogs. On every bend, on every street corner, there's about 100,000 that live in the city. Now, over the last two decades, there's been some fantastic research that has actually shown that leopards make use of this hyperabundant food source. They eat about 25 to 60% dogs. Now when I came back to Brisbane, I kind of mulled over this idea and I thought, well, you know what, what about these leopards eating these dogs? Couldn't that potentially have health ramifications on the people that live on the edge of this national park? There's about 35 leopards that live in 104 square kilometers in this forest in amidst this massive metropole. So we calculate they consume about 1,800 dogs. And in the process, they save the Mumbai government about 20,000 US dollars each year. That's about 10% of their dog management budget. In the process, they save about 300 bites on humans. And we hypothesize that if you were to pull leopards out of the system and convert natural forests, you get an exponential increase in the number of people that are actually bitten by dogs. I think it's a really sexy way of looking at big cat conservation, especially in places that are still plagued by disease. 
India is actually still ravaged by rapes. About 20,000 people die there every year. But unfortunately, we're losing these cats. And we lose them because in a lot of places, they often clash with the things that we hold most valuable to us. Human lives and the things we like to eat. Cattle, sheep, goats, they like to eat them most. Even this female lioness, she got speared for eating cattle in the, in the Maasai Mara Conservancy. Along with the threat of bushmeat hunting, that's where poor rural people actually set wire snares in forests to try and catch animals to eat. But in the process, cats step into these snares and lose their legs and sometimes their lives. And also there's the illegal body part trade in big cats in the Far East. These are the main reasons why we're down to 23,000 lions and maybe 3,000 tigers in just a fraction of the historic range. With things like jaguars, mountain lions, and snow leopards, it's more difficult to put a number on them because they live in places like this. Next time you're in Mount Everest, know that there's snow leopards there. So why are we losing? Why are we losing these big cats if we have these incredible protected area systems? This is the Serengeti, 5,695 square miles. The size, half the size of Belgium. Same in Chobe and Botswana, even South Luanga and Zambia. These are some of the largest protected areas on the planet. But it doesn't help if they're only protected on paper. And if you can't get enough resources into the manager's hands who maintain fence lines that keep people out and the cats in, and also to do anti-poaching patrols. We just don't have enough money to do big cat conservation. You need about a billion dollars a year to protect the major African lion protected areas in Africa. You need about 35 million to safeguard tigers. Half the reason that pie is so much smaller for tigers is because they only live in about 6% of the historic range in about 42 key source populations. This talk got pretty dark pretty quickly, didn't it? We went from leopards helping people to us not having enough cash to help them back. Well, I've got two ideas that I've been working on with my group here in Brisbane and also in Africa. The first I call Cats for Cats Hope and Responsibility. And the second one is about making that lions eating cattle and tigers eating goats into a commercial-based insurance business. So let's talk about the first one. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of products out there that use big cats every day in their marketing, advertising, and branding. In fact, if you just type in the five largest species by name into a global company register, you'll find about 23,000 companies that use big cat names. When it comes to products and mascots, we can just look at the leopard from Cartier, Exxon Mobil's SO the Tiger. There are a lot of companies, and some of them already give something back. They recognize the value of protecting the things that are on their mascots. But what if we were to scale this idea up a little? get more companies to give back, and just give back a fraction of their sales. Let's just look at one company. This is Tiger Bear. Tiger's been on their mascot for about 82 years. That coincides roughly to the time this massive Singaporean beer actually lost its own tiger. Now they brew a lot of beer, about 5.1 million hectoliters. It's about 1.5 billion, 330 milliliter cans of beer. In the process, they make about 1.6 billion dollars in sales every year. If they were to give just 1% of sales back to saving tigers, that would get you about 1,100 additional tigers in five countries and eight locations, including Malaysia, Thailand, and even Russia. What if we were to scale this idea up and apply it to lion conservation? These are just the 17 companies from the Forbes Global 2000 largest companies that use big cats and lions in their emblems. If they were to give just 1% of their sales, they'd be able to solve the conservation funding shortfall by nearly three times. 0.1% of their profits, that'll get you about a quarter of the way where you need to be. But why should they give back? I mean, it's pretty cool to be able to tell your board of shareholders that we give back to mass funds. But I think it's also a question about practices. Practices that affect the cats in their natural habitat. This is Kellogg's. Tony the Tiger has been on their mascot for over 50 years. But ironically enough, just in 2013, they were busted for using unsustainably sourced palm oil from the Rio plantation in Sumatra. It's the last place on earth, people, where tigers actually live on an island. There's probably only about 400 of them left. This is the idea ambitious. I don't know if it is. 
All of these companies on the right hand side gave on average 4.6 of their pre-tax profits in the 2013 fiscal year to charitable causes. 1% for the planet, an initiative started by the same people who founded Patagonia Clothing. They've got 3,000 member companies that give on average $100 million every year to environmental causes. But what about this business of lions eating cattle and tigers eating goats? Well, it's a lot of what I'm looking at for my PhD and I'm working with this talented man. His name is Brian Courtney and he works for the Elephant Saturn Conservation Trust. And he was a pioneer because he was the first man in Africa to actually ensure wildlife against natural disasters for private game ranches. Now we're trying to address a very kind of commonly used initiative to guard against human wildlife conflict in Africa. And it's called human wildlife conflict compensation. And the model goes that you have a poor rural African farmer somewhere on the border of a national park, say for instance Tanzania, he's got a hundred head of cattle. Every fortnight or so, a female lioness visits him, maybe grabs two of those. He thinks, well, you know what, I've had enough. I'm going to poison her and her cubs, or maybe I'll even spear her. You can kind of understand, if you're only living for five dollars a day, that you do the same. People like us, NGOs, even governments say, whoa, you probably shouldn't spear the line. It's got tourism value and it's also got intricate conservation value, right? So they say, we'll pay you full market value of whatever you lose as long as you can prove that lions have killed the cattle. Well, we're saying that it's a dangerous financial model because no one can afford to insure a thousand head of stock every year. You can imagine a government that's bolted into, say, 5, 10, 15 compensation schemes that's going to run them dry in terms of economics and money. So what we're saying is that we should probably be looking towards the insurance business insurance companies globally, Alliance, the Lloyds Bank of London, even Berkshire Hathaway. We're saying that there fundamentally shouldn't be a difference between them offering car insurance, house insurance, even line insurance on cattle. And we believe that with the right data, they definitely can underwrite this risk and change the potential face of the way that we fund conflict with lions across the African continent. So basically the model changes Everything stays the same in the first half of the slide, but the role of the funder changes from being the one who is administering the fund to the one who is actually paying the premium, a much smaller amount of money, and it's these guys that are covering the insurance. So where do we go from here? I wanted to finish off my talk with a couple of images. This is a photograph of a serval. It's a much smaller cat, it's not a big cat. They occur in a lot of grasslands and wetlands across the southern African area. Now this particular population is in a place called Secunda, South Africa, and they live right next to one of the largest petrochemical plants in Southern Africa. Now you'd think that's probably bad for servals, right? But ironically enough, SASL are mandated to rehabilitate and maintain about 3,500 hectares of pristine serval habitat. In the process, you've got about 75 cats that live there. I wanted to put this photo up. Because I wholeheartedly believe that in the 21st century, and if our kids want to see lions, leopards, jaguars, we're going to have to partner with a lot of these corporates, a lot of these big giants, and get them to help us in conserving the cats that we love so much. So Tiger Beer, Jaguar Motors, maybe even Persia, if you're listening, I wholeheartedly think that we can work together and we can make a change together. Thank you.